I have joy. Joy, joy, joy. Overflowing in my life. I have joy, joy, joy. Overflowing in my life. And the same goes for you. Why do we have this joy? It's not because everything is going well in our life, if I can be real. It's not that everything is going well in this world. So how come we, I can stand here today, regardless of what's going on, and say that I have joy? It is because of the manifestation of the righteousness of God. It is because of the manifestation of the righteousness of God that bring joy overflowing in my life over and against all the circumstances that may come to me or have come to me in my life. The righteousness of God who overlooked my mistakes and saw a way to bring me closer to him. I am overflowing with joy. And that is the center, the heart of Paul's letter to the believers in Rome and for us today. In this letter that we're about to look at in Romans chapter 3, it is the heart of the gospel because it shows God's solemn, irreversible, and effective act of redemption is grace and his mercy and justice for all humanity. And that is the message for today, and you might have guessed it already, the manifestation of God's righteousness. As we approach Passover, which is coming up April 17, I don't like to use the word Easter, but I rather either Resurrection Sunday or leading up to the Passover. So to that end, look with me in your Bibles, whether that may be book form or electronic form, whatever form you have it on, look with me to roll yeah, with me in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But before going there, I want to give us, I give you the backdrop leading up to this text. You see, in the beginning of Romans chapter 3, Paul was making the argument that the faithlessness of others in regards to the truth of God's words does not nullify God's faithfulness. Does that make sense? He goes on to say or conclude in verse 20 that no human being will be justified in, the God, in God's sight because by the works of the law. It is my understanding that when Paul used the word law, he is not talking about all of God's law. But I think he is speaking in specifically to the ceremonial law that he had put in place. As we'll see this as we go through the text. So that's my understanding that Paul is referring to, even though he did not say it explicitly, when he says the law, that no human being can be justified in the sight of God through the law. I don't think he was speaking about the Ten Commandments. Those are God's moral laws. Those they still stand today. That is given, you read about it, the, uh, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, and then again it's repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Paul goes on to say, it's since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Therefore, all human beings are held accountable to God. So the question is, how can a sinful people stand before a holy unrighteous God. Are you with me? If all, you know, how can sinful people stand before an holy and righteous God? And that's what brings me joy. This brings me to our main text, text in verse 21 through 26. 
So here it goes, and you can follow along on the screen. After Paul concludes in verse 25, he says this, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophet bear witness to it. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a appropriation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sin, verse 26, and it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be justified and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for the preservation and the reading of your word. Father God, I, we pray now, God, as we dig deeper into this letter from Paul, this passage from Paul, that our mind be open and be illuminated to receive what you are saying through your word and then apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So from the reading of the passage that we have just read, I want to draw or bring to our attention three observations that Paul uh, highlighted. And the first one is God's righteousness is distinct from the law. God's righteousness is distinct from the law. What does that mean? That the law had nothing to do with God's mercy. So as human beings, we cannot work or do anything to obtain the righteousness of God. So when I say that Paul is speaking of the ceremonial law, what the ceremonial law did, you had to bring sacrifices. You have to be on your goody two shoe. Well, you can't be too good enough to satisfy God. So it's not by our goodness, it's not by our wealth, but because of God's righteous mercy. Does that make sense? You see, the law was a shadow or a precursor of God's righteousness that all the scripture speaks of that Paul speaks of. So from Genesis to Malachi, it speaks of God's righteousness. So God's righteousness is not something that just suddenly appeared. It's something that has been forever. Does that make sense? Yeah. The God the writer of Hebrew puts it best, talking about the law and God's righteousness. He says this in Hebrews 9, verses 23 through 24. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. What he's talking about with these rites, with the ceremonial law. But the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy place made with hands. He's talking about the tabernacle. That was a copy, a precursor that was made by hand, which was a copy of the through things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God and our behalf. If anything, that gave me great joy is knowing that God has did what no human being could, can do, done what I could never have done on my own. But because of his righteousness, he has accomplished what we human beings could not accomplish, which leads me to the second observation that the manifestation of God's righteousness is through faith in 
Jesus Christ. Now, this faith is not a blind faith. It's not just believing. Are you, are you with me? It is what I call reasonable faith. What I mean by that? Reality is what conforms to truth. Conforms to truth. Does that make sense? Reality makes something either right or be a lie. So, for example, I can sincerely believe that I can go up onto the Empire State Building and flap my arms and I will fly. I could sincerely believe that. But the reality is, I'm going to hit ground. And when I hit ground, I will be no more. But I can sincerely believe that. So reality is that which conforms to truth. So when we speak about faith in God, it's not a blind faith. It's not a leap of faith. God shows up to show us that he is real. So the reality of God's righteousness is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ to show up in this world to let us know that there is a way out of the darkness of sin. He entered this world to reveal himself to humanity to provide an effective and irreversible way for the redemption of humanity. From what? From God's impending judgment on sin. I said it many times. The problem that we have in the world is not a lack of uh, government. It's not a lack of jobs, but it is because of the, the depravity of sin. You pour back when God created this world, he created a peaceful, harmonic world. Everything worked together. But something happened and disrupted that. And from ever since, man is trying to fix something they can't fix. Only God can resolve the issue, and the issue is sin. When people recognize that they need a savior. So God shows up and his act of redemption is irreversible. The Bible says all of sin, which leads me, I should say now, to the terms observation, jumping ahead of myself that Paul make in this passage of Romans chapter 3, which again, as I said, is the hallmark, the center of Paul's gospel or Paul's letter in Romans. This is the center of the book of Romans. The third observation is this, that Paul made, and this is what gave me great joy. There is no distinction with God when it comes to sin amongst humanity. God make no distinction. He's not looking at man and saying, my sin is bigger than your sin. He makes no distinction. And this, in my opinion, takes us out of the comparison trap. Because when I look at someone else and try to measure myself against them, I'm going to make a false judgment because I got to remember I am really no different. I'm a sinner just like them, but because of God's grace and his mercy changed my life. Amen. But we tend as human beings to look at another and judge them from our human perspective rather than from God's perspective. Because from God's perspective, say, y'all are sinners. You all don't seek after me. No one. None of you are righteous. So he removed the comparison trap that we do not measure ourselves against our fellow man, but we measure ourselves against God. 
And when we look at God, we see that we still have a long way to go. So God makes no distinction, again, because he said, for all, who is all? And I hate to say this, but it's the gospel, it's the truth. Even our newborn little baby that we love so much is a little sinner. It's hard, but it's true. Because all doesn't exclude anyone. Does that make sense? All has the potential to sin. You just put two little babies in the same room and, and observe. One is going to be dominant over the other. I guarantee it. Who did they learn it from? Not from mom and dad, but it is within them. Does that make sense? So when the Bible says all of sin, it did, does not exclude anyone. It includes everyone. But yet, the good news is, at the same time, God offers to all the means of justification. And that is the good news. To be found guiltless by his gift of grace through Jesus Christ. So our boasting, as Paul said, is not within myself. My boasting is in what Christ has done for me. Jesus Christ paid the price for our sin. We are justified by his grace as a gift. It's something that he didn't have to do, but he did it anyway. Why? to receive us back to himself. Does that make sense? God did not create us to leave us by ourselves. Does that make sense? He created us to be in relationship with him. And because that relationship was distorted, Way back in the Garden of Eden, if we, re, if we believe that there is a literal Garden of Eden, and if we literally believe that there is a Adam and there is a Eve, that God made man and he made a woman and he placed them in a perfect environment. But something happened that came and distorted the, through, the truth of God's word. By making it seem so convincing that, oh, the first human being, the first set of human being put God's side, God's word aside and bought a lie. God told Adam and Eve, do not eat of this tree in the garden. In the midst of the garden, you could go back in Genesis and read it. That's where it's all started because everything has a beginning. And then the whole serpent showed up. And got hold of Eve's, Eve's ears. I don't know where Adam was, but I assume he was right there. But in either case, the enemy came in and said, did God really say? Now, that, that's convincing, plausible. Paul says, don't get away by philosophy, empty philosophy, or cunning of humanness. So the devil came in and he spoke to him very convincingly. Did God really say? And she responded, yep, he said, don't even touch it. No, 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 he's just joshing with you. 
You see, God is holding something back from you. I'm paraphrasing. You see, the day you eat of this fruit that God tell you don't touch, you will be wise. You'll be just like God. Now that was a convincing argument for Eve because she followed through. But no, this thing didn't take effect until Adam ate of it. And that disobedience has been a domino effect ever since. So sin, when we look at God's grace, when we look at his gift, he passed over those things. And he paid the price for our sin through his shed blood. Christ shows God's righteousness. When we want to look at the grace of God, and at the same time look at the judgment of God, we need to look at the cross. Because the cross is where that God chose. Man did not put Jesus on the cross. He voluntarily gave himself to satisfy God's wrath for us on the cross. Does that make sense? His shed blood paid the price once and for all. That there is nothing that we can do that can satisfy the wrath of God. The wrath of God is satisfied through the works of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? A point that he made clear to Nicodemus. We can be religious all we want and thinking that we're right with God. But religion will not make us right with God. Does that make sense? Nicodemus was a very religious man. He was a very educated man. But he missed the grace of God. And Nick, Jesus made this point to Nicodemus in John 3, 16, 18. When Nicodemus asked him, how can a man be born again? Must he go into his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus said, you're a teacher of the law and you don't get this? <laughs> you're supposed to be a rabbi. You're supposed to know, you should know this answer, Nicodemus. He says, the only way a man can change is through the spirit of God. And he gave him an analogy. It says the wind blows, but you know where it comes from or where it goes, but you can see the effect. Mm. And it's only the Holy Spirit of God can change someone art. We can't change anyone. And then he goes on to say this to Nicodemus, a very famous passage or well-known passage, but we often leave out verse 17 and 18. And verse John chapter 3, 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whomever, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That is the good news. For God, verse 17 goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. So when I read that passage of what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, hey, I love humanity. Why? Because I created you. 
And it's hard to destroy something that you create. Does that make sense? So God does not want to destroy or condemn when he speaks about the world. He's speaking about human beings. He says, I love the world. I love you all. He did not, I did not come to condemn you. I come to save you. What am I saving you from? By judgment and sin. I say it again. If we want to look at the seriousness of sin, look at the cross. And if you want to see the depth of God's love, look at the cross. The cross is a reality. Because if it wasn't a reality, it wouldn't be true. Does that make sense? But the cross is a reality. Jesus Christ is a reality. He's not a figment of our imagination, as I thought when I was an atheist and did not know the word of God, did not encounter God, I should say, in my life. I just thought God was something people made up to make them feel better. Until I met the risen Christ. Change my old perspective. So God is not a figment of one's imagination. He is alive and he is truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So despite what other religions say out there, they can Believe what they want to believe. Like I said, you can sincerely believe something and you can be sincerely wrong. But God just don't want us to believe he wants us to experience the reality of who he is. So he came into this world. For example, when he stand before Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and he said, is it true that you're a king? Jesus said, you said that I am a king. And Jesus said to him, I came to reveal the truth. Pilate, living in a world just like ours, because truth in the world is not, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, objective. It's not we don't, we, today, culture don't believe in objective truth. Because everything can be true, depends on how I look at it. So Pilate said in his word, because there were so many gods, what is true? There's so many different understanding of what truth is. So Pilate asked a really good question. What is truth? A question that Jesus didn't respond to because he said, Pilate, you're looking at the truth. <laughs> truth is standing right before you. In your face, I am the reality of truth. So God is real. If it's not real, we could not believe in the song we just sung. I believe in miracle. I believe in the goodness of God. It would be a waste of time if Jesus Christ it was not real. Does that make sense? It wouldn't even make sense for us to be gathered here today because we'd be just be wasting my time, our time. We'd be wasting my time speaking to you. But because God is real, because he loves us and wants to know, shut, let us know, the depth of his love that he has for us, but also the depth of his judgment on sin. God loves us, but he loves us too much to leave us where he found us. Does that make sense? We have to be transformed by him. Does that make sense? We can't change ourselves. I can read all the self-help book that I want to read and live in a better life, but my better life begins when I come to realize that God has already done everything for me. He's, 
No, you, you, we, 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 we rebook to become a better parent, to become a better mom, to become a better husband. But I say to you, the only way we can become better is when we look at who Christ is in our lives. He is the one that's going to speak to us when we are going down the wrong path. He is the one that's going to prick our hearts to make the decision that he wants us to make. So I cannot become a better person in of myself. I only can become a better person when I live my life in relationship to Jesus Christ. And so that's why I have joy. When I think of where I was, where God found me, and yet he looked over my sin and what I have said and done and see what I can become in him and through him. It's only through the grace of God. As Paul said, I am what I am because of the grace of God. Who was Paul? He was a persecutor of the believers. Dragging people to jail who call upon Jesus because he thought they were wrong and he was right until he encountered the living God. Change his perspective. Change my perspective. So in coming to a close, I want to say this. Despite the circumstances that comes to us in life, we can have joy. Despite the circumstances, again, that comes to us in life, we can have joy in what Christ has done for us on the cross and continue to do for us, being an intercessor for us in the heavenly places. Does that make sense? The Bible says sometimes life can crush you, and I'm paraphrasing, that we don't even know how to pray or what to pray because Things are pressing in. But when things are pressing in on you, the Bible tells me the Holy Spirit intercedes for you. He takes that moaning. He takes that groaning. He takes those tears and he lifts them up before the Holy God. So there is nothing that happened to us in life that takes him by surprise. There is nothing that happens to us or can happen to us that he cannot take care of. The goodness of God. Let me give you an example. In this, I should say, April issue, we are still in March, but the, the magazine comes to me like a week or so before the month end which is Voice of the Martyr. And this is a magazine or ministry that keeps uh, in touch with what's going on around the world with believers that are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about denomination. It's not about religion. But it's about those who said, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. So in April's issue magazine, they highlighted a Muslim or a former Muslim that came to Christ upon receiving the gospel message in the region of Niger, Africa. That's where he lived. His name is, uh, let me see if I pronounce this right, Warrini. Did I, did I say that right? Put, put that quote up. War, W-A-R-A-R-N-I. Help me pronounce that word, his name. Warrenie, right? So after receiving the gospel and receiving Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and because he was a Muslim and that region of the world he was living in, several attempts was made on his life. Because he is now sharing, not only receive it, he is now sharing it. And they wanted us to stop him. So he said this after several attempts in his life. This is his quote. 
I am happy more than how somebody can be happy. Whatever problem I face or facing, when I think of what is happening, I forget about everything and I just rejoice in the Lord. He made that statement when the Muslim that he was a part of heard of his faith and not only heard of his faith, but he was sharing the good news of the gospel without a Muslim. No, that doesn't happen here. And they came to his house. Pulled him out to shoot him. And he made this quote. I am happy. I am more than happy. How could he say that? Because he knows who he belongs to. Does that make sense? So the end of the matter is this. People can choose to live a life of joy or a life of sorrow by accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ. My hope is, is that they choose a life of joy. Because when we look at life, life is not short. As we often hear it says, Oh, life is so short. No, no, life is not short. Life is extremely long. Life is infinite. That's what the Bible calls eternal life. And we can choose to live eternity either with God or apart from God. Does that make sense? So that's what Warini did. He chose joy. Because if they had ended his life, his, no, his life is not, that is not the end of his life. Does that make sense? It is only the beginning. So when we look at eternity, it is infinite. We look at our life between the time we were born and the dash the day we close our eyes in this side of the earth. But life doesn't end there. It goes on. How do I know that? Or how do we know that? Because of what Christ was done. You see, if Christ only died on the cross, it wouldn't solve, made all his promises, would it? But the fact and the reality is, he rose from the dead. And so with the cross, it shows, again, the seriousness of God's judgment and sin. But with the resurrection, it shows that life is always, will always continue. And so with that, I just want to say, remember, eternity is infinite. So I say to everyone. Choose joy, which come through Jesus Christ. Choose joy. When we choose joy, when we choose Christ, and when I speak of joy, I'm speaking of Christ because he is my joy. Does that make sense? When we choose Christ, he will not only give us joy, but he will guard our hearts. He will guide our mind and he will guide our steps in the circumstances of life. Does that make sense? He will give you and I the strength to endure the circumstances that comes to us in life. Things that come to us in life is sometimes it's not easy. It's burdensome. But he said, take my yoke. Come alongside me and learn from me. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
He did not, he does not want us to be carry a burdensome life by ourselves. Yes, life can be a burden, but it is great to do life with somebody who can bear our burden. Keep me, I know, from the mental hospital. <laughs> it gives me sleep and rest at night. So I have that peace that only God can give. The peace that surpasses my natural understanding. And when again I go back, I want to stop, talk about the ceremonial law. They have what is called a peace offering. But that peace offering is only a shadow. Jesus Christ is our peace. Because in Isaiah, he said, that the prophets and the law, they speak about it. Isaiah said, the prince of peace. So I can have peace in the midst, as I speak about last week, of chaos. I can have joy, not because everything is going right, but because of God who give me the strength to have joy. The apostle, said, the apostle Paul tells us, I believe in, in Thessalonians, rejoice in the Lord always. And in case you didn't get it, I say it again, rejoice in the Lord. Despite the circumstances, rejoice in the Lord because the circumstances are you that you do not define you Christ define you don't let the circumstances of life define you or measure the circumstances up to God because God is greater than any circumstances we will ever face we just got to fix our eyes on him as the psalmist says, David know quite well. He says in Psalms 28, 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart, my heart exalt, and with my song I give thanks to him. Now when I read that, I think David had an option. He could let the circumstances of life derail them from giving thanks to God. But he said, no, you are my source of my strength. You are my protector. The shield, when you look at shield, it protects because the enemy wants to shoot some fire darts at you. He wants not only to hinder you, he wants to burn you up. That's why Paul tells us the weapon of our warfare is not carnal, but is mighty through God in pulling down the stronghold. It's not mighty through just praying, but my prayer to God that pulls down the stronghold in my life. Because there's many other religions out there that pray, but I don't know if they're praying to the living God. Does that make sense? But when I pray to the God who exists, the God who lives, the God who came into this world to show himself real and to die for my sin and resurrected from the dead, not by human power, but by the Spirit of God that give me new life in him, who give me meaning and purpose to life. We can give thanks to God when we know who he is in our life. We can live in joy because he is the strength of our life. Does that make sense today? So let us keep our minds and our heart focused on him, not on the circumstances or what's going on in our world. When we see what's going on in our world, just reorientate our minds back to the truth of God's word. And it will give us peace. It will give us joy. So I want to end you with this song because I think it's his fitting. It says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. My joy comes through my relationship with Jesus Christ. 
and nothing can take that joy away from me. Same thing applies to you. Does that make sense today? So let's uh, sit or stand or just let the song minister to you. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Regardless of the circumstances that you're dealing with right now, remember the joy of the Lord is your strength. Thank you, Lord God. That no matter the present suffering that we may be facing or will be facing, Lord God, that too shall pass because there's a better day that is coming. Lord God, we thank you for all that you have done and continue to do in our lives. Lord, you are the strength of our joy. Let us, O oh God, as a people, keep our minds and our hearts focused on you and on the truth of your word. That says, you will never leave us nor forsake us. You will be with us until you return. So God, we thank you that your word is true and will not come back to you void, but it will accomplish what it will in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And so we lead now into... 